All right, so uh, we'll continue with uh, basically the machine learning uh, aspect of uh, musical sequences, which is the second part of class five. Uh, and um, I'll kind of review very briefly the idea of Markov models because I think it will uh, help to understand why we actually use the Lambda Z. Um, and uh, please also <clears throat> check out the video from uh, from our last meeting where uh, we discussed the Markov model more in detail. What I would like to do is kind of explain the kind of the relations and how it's related to information theory as well. So lentil ziv is really a compression algorithm. Well, Markov model is a statistical model. And, um, you know, the idea is that uh, we'll be using lentil ziv just because of its uh, information theory properties that it can compress or the code book that it creates is supposed to be um, optimal, at least asymptotically, so it can actually achieve the entropy. So in some sense, uh, the introduction to information theory was uh, partially, you know, the, the basic concept that we'll also need for uh, the machine learning and the deep neural network um, aspects later on, and also some of the variable Markov Oracle and materials that are planned for this week um, were kind of used concepts of information theory uh, to derive find repetitions or find the optimal representation of music. Uh, but the, there is basically uh, the, the trick that we are doing is instead of designing our own algorithms, we, um, uh, we use the idea that uh, um, you know, a good compression algorithm actually creates for us a code book that captures the structure of our data. So for generative purposes, um, we might say, you know, this is good enough. I mean, we can actually sample from this code book and create our sequences. Uh, so let me kind of briefly explain what is the difficulty with Markov models. Uh, so we said that uh, Markov models could be uh, represented or could be understood as some kind of finite state machine with probabilistic transitions. And uh, the example we analyzed was the first order Markov chain, where uh, the first order is actually represented by the fact that once you're in a state, that state corresponds to a single last uh, step. So once you, once you move from one, one of the states to another one, uh, it's equivalent to, let's say, emitting a symbol, but also this symbol represents, you know, the previous one was, you know, was a, an encapsulation or it captured all the past memory, okay? So this is not like throwing a random coin. So if we go really and run this Markov model uh, infinite number of times, steps, uh, one can show that uh, it does arrive at some stable state probability, which means there will be some kind of distribution over all of which states we are in but this is not uh, an IID process, which means this is not like independently, uh, independent and identically distributed uh, step. It's it's not just like drawing from uh, from an urn with three. Uh, let's say you have three states. So it's not like you have a hidden, you know, uh, urn with three different balls, three colors, or ABC, and each one appears with different number of counts. Uh, this is a stable state. But still, if you are in a certain state, you have the conditional probabilities of moving to the next step. So um, we have shown that uh, the entropy rate, or you know, basically the information contained in this process is actually not simply pi log pi, but it's pi times the conditional probability log conditional probability. And this is much lower, one can prove that. So what happens if we have more memory, okay? If we want to map this to longer memory, um, so this is Markov model right now of order one, or Markov one. Let's say we have a process where we use tuples, which means we want to use the last two steps or two symbols generated to predict the, the next one, okay? Uh, do we need a different model? Well, basically we can just extend this model 
by having ABC not represent the actual emissions, the actual symbols, what we'll have will actually, these are three states, okay? Now we'll have all possible pairs, okay? We'll have three to the power of two, okay? Because we have the, the, the last step, which is three possibilities and one before that three possibilities, so three times three, we have nine possibilities. So now suddenly this uh, automata will uh, be uh, instead of three dimensional, nine dimensional, and we'll have one state, which is AA, another state will be AB, another state will be AC, you'll have a state BA, BB, BC, CA, CB, CC. So this matrix, okay, will actually be now, um, well, sorry, again, it depends if you multiply this on the left, okay, and this, then you have these three states here, okay, this is where you are, so you're still, the S will be still three because you emit ABC, but your, um, possibilities here, okay, will be basically, uh, sorry, so sorry, so your, your previous state will be all possible uh, and nine possibilities, okay, so what we'll have here is um, basically a state that goes into nine possible, uh, from nine possible uh, situations into three, so uh, what we'll have is uh, the, the state itself, okay will be represented by a matrix that has three by nine okay so the probability of emitting uh any any of the new symbols will depend on nine possible previous states okay and these nine possible states will be basically moved to the next three so the matrix becomes basically three by nine you look up again the uh, the state that happened before so every time you basically will have three by nine metrics here where uh, the probability was well uh, nine possible states which correspond to the two previous um, outcome and this will generate the next step and then you kind of take this step you uh, look at the uh, step before and you again translate this to uh, a nine-dimensional state vector uh, so you can kind of think about either emissions of matrix nine by three or moving from uh, to the uh, nine dimensional state to another nine dimensional state uh, instead of rewriting actually explicitly moving from state but then you'll have a lot of um, zeros because you always have to carry the previous state uh, to the next one. But this is kind of the idea. Once you increase the memory of Markov, your matrix explodes by uh, the number of steps, okay? Actually, it's, it's the size of the alphabet to the power of the number of steps. So when I said that, you know, the Markov frauds as high order Markov sources are hard to estimate because you have huge PIJs because the state space becomes um, um, exponential in, in the size of the memory, okay? So instead of dealing with long, so if we have sequences like music, right? or text where uh, the dependencies could be long, okay? Uh, to capture them, we can either use tuples, triplets, and tuples, but this creates very uh, elaborate and hard to estimate models because you have a lot of parameters. This is where, you know, the um, lempel z idea comes in. Um, and frankly, you know, until this interpretation that came uh, about 10 years after the algorithm was created, uh, the algorithm itself, the, the compression, which actually looks for repeated uh, subsequences and compresses by sending a pointer to the previous block and only sending the next symbol, which is the new one. Um, you know, um, although it was proven to be optimal for any order of Markov model, it wasn't really given a probabilistic interpretation. So there was a separate paper um, that um, actually suggested how to assign probabilities and the probabilities are by counting the number of leaves uh, <clears throat> or the junctions all the way up to you know the, the point where you are <clears throat> and this was the example so uh, if we are if you want to generate or estimate a b r a c uh, estimate the probability then we know that a had nothing B had a context A, R 
which appears after a b actually has no lookup in the tree this is why it's not in bold so r will be j basically using the probability of uh, two sevenths uh, then the next a which has the context a b r actually will only find the r as the context and you can look it up according to the tree and find the probability of this and then the c which has basically the suffix a b r a uh, only has a to use as its probability so you can see how kind of like it shifts between it well here is a short enough example so the context is either nothing or one nothing or one okay at the tree grows your context could be very long sequences so you can think about this as a variable markov model but it's really not derived by uh, doing um, matrix calculations or histograms the way you would normally do with markov model where you count basically the occurrences of, of uh, pairs of triplets and so on and normalizing them. It actually does this in a very efficient way. And surprisingly enough, if the sequence is very long, um, it is as efficient as uh, any order Markov model. Uh, efficient in terms of the encoding properties, but the model itself is much more compact. It's actually a tree. You don't need to store huge matrices of all possible end states moving to the next and next state. Um, so, uh, in, in the homework, you're kind of asked to implement the incremental parsing algorithm, which is very simple. And then there was a question, so what is the purpose of uh, this one example that I think somebody posted in Biazzo was, there was like a subtree here and just a single node. So what is the purpose of this one? Well, if you have no context, if you, have, if you don't know anything, uh, then you actually have relative weights. You have the whole branch here. Well, here is an example of three. So let's say if, if you come to generate uh, uh, where we have B, well, this B is generated based on A, but if something happened and you didn't have any context to rely, you would go to B in the probability of one sevenths. Or here, we have an example where we actually go to R, okay? And the context of A, B wasn't useful for us. So we end up being again at the top, and then we choose between A, B and R, according to the relative weight of all the symbols that occur down. And if we have seven symbols, so here going to A would be four out of seven, B one out of seven, and R is two out of seven because you can go to R and A. And this specific assignment of probabilities, again, uh, this is kind of a, a method that was proven to be um, corresponding or correctly corresponding to the statistical interpretation of, of the Lempel Z with the incremental parsing algorithm. Um, so this is the purpose. I mean, you have these single nodes or, or very short nodes and long nodes because once you are in any any junction here, uh, you can calculate the relative probabilities of taking any of these uh, uh, trajectories or splitting splitting into any of these continuations. Um, in uh, in our uh, musical applications, actually. Uh, the first uh, implementation was uh, in a software that is called Open Music. Um, and uh, this is a, a graphical musical composition environment. Uh, and the idea here is, I know how you can actually generate more musical melodies or materials without uh, encoding any musical rules. So, um, kind of the process was, you know, you throw in a MIDI file here. Uh, there is a lot of, I don't know if to call it black magic, but some kind of a, a aspect of representation of MIDI because music, MIDI is polyphonic. You have a lot of melodies. I mean, you eventually have to either extract one line or find a way to represent multiple notes together as a symbol. Because again, the lempel ziv algorithm, the way it was designed, assumes a sequence, which is a finite alphabet. Uh, it doesn't allow you for parallel, you know, uh, alphabets. You have to either to collapse this into cross alphabets somehow, or uh, decide that you cluster uh, simultaneous notes into other states. Um, but anyway, once you do from media to some kind of a cross alphabet, now you have a sequence. You run the lempel ziv incremental par parsing algorithm, and then you generate. And the generation is done with this motif continuation. Uh, method 
uh, and um, you know you you go back from your cross alphabet to MIDI to notes, and then you generate uh, a, a new sequence. Of course, there is some effort to to make it look correctly as a musical notation. So there's some extra steps taken here to divide this into bar and, and represent correctly the, the timing. And again, the cross alphabet also has to treat not only the note appearances, but also continuations uh, or uh, different durations, I would say. So if you, have, if you hold a note, how do you represent it as a note that basically continues over several MIDI ticks? So uh, yeah, even though it looks very elegant and straightforward, uh, there is a lot of kind of massaging, preparing the data that uh, goes into deriving a nice sounding melody. In your uh, assignment, we talk about using just one melody, so you don't have to deal with uh, cross alphabet across multiple voices. And you have to deal somehow with the question of how do you present notes and durations as a sequence so you can actually parse it and continue. Now, what about the continuation? Okay, let me kind of go one step back and explain a little bit about the continuation algorithm. Uh, so the way uh, this tree can be used to generate, okay? Uh, of course, if you start with an empty sl uh, slate, uh, you're here and then you kind of go and, and, and generate something according to the probabilities uh, that this tree um, um, kind of provides to you. Now, um, you know, you, you can see here that the longest sequence you would generate is only two, right? You either generate B and then you're stuck, you generate R and then you have to continue into A, or if you go into A, you have these three possibilities. So how would you generate the next, uh, uh, or how can you generate sequences that are longer than the depth of the tree? So the, the, the motive is just a way to represent this uh, efficiently, but the idea is that uh, you look up the context of what you generated before. And then uh, let's say if you generate A, B, okay, now you can go back and see, well, A, B is too long, there is no continuation, but I can cut the tail. So I'll try and shorten this and get to B. Well, if I go to B, and there is also no continuation. So I'll have basically to cut the whole thing and I'll have to randomly select a new symbol from the root. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, well, I mean, here, if, if I generate the first RA, okay, uh, and I don't know how to continue uh, deeper, then I can uh, throw away the R and just use the latest state A or the last, latest emission symbol A and then I know that if I go here, I do have a choice of B, C, D. So uh, kind of the logic is that you percolate through this tree until you hit uh, the, the, the leaves, I mean, the, the bottom level. And uh, when you, once you get to that level, you start cutting from the, uh, you know, from the farther away memory, you basically, trim your sequence by throwing away, you know, the oldest symbol, and then you try to look it up through that tree. And if you don't find this, you trim it again. So you basically keep chopping the tail until you actually find the place where uh, you can still have a continuation. Uh, and then you basically do this one step and, and then you, you move down the tree until you, um, you know, hit the longest sequence that was already analyzed. Um, and since this is not an efficient pr procedure, okay, so the IP continuation uh, creates a new dictionary that uh, makes this lookup much more efficient. So uh, I hope, you know, this pseudocode uh, is clear enough to suggest how we actually build a dictionary and how we look up the continuation, but this dictionary is basically just a, a modification or re rework of the motive function that represents the tree in, in the shape of a dictionary where you have basically, you know, the root and then all the continuations. You have each one of the first level um, leaves or the first level, um, so how do we call them? These are leaves and these are the, uh, the parents, okay? Uh, and so on. 
So um, this is basically the idea that led to some early implementation is Lempel Zip, and later on we moved also to doing some other uh, string matching algorithms, uh, which were more efficient than Lempel Zip, but still uh, stayed with the same idea. If you have a good string matching uh, algorithm that can be also used for compression, uh, you can kind of reuse that, uh, that representation for uh, generating more variations. So here are kind of a couple of examples uh, of a system like this. So it, it, it runs live or real time. You have a musician playing into the computer. Uh, this is my colleague Joao and uh, from, here come from Paris. And what the system does, he actually controls, I mean, there are a bunch of parameters that you can control, like the probabilities of jumps and, and the, the length of the memory. But uh, kind of to give an idea, this is pretty abstract musical piece. I'll just play an excerpt from it just to explain the motivation of uh, why we are doing, or what are the possibilities of, um, of using such an algorithm. So the musician starts entering some music material. And at a certain point, the computer will start playing back. Accompaniment is done basically by by the computer, based on the music that uh, the musician played. One of the uh, difficulties that we had was that um, it's hard to anticipate what's going to happen. So the musician kind of had to listen, and in parallel uh, imagine his own improvisation. There were some other versions of of the same method that uh, try to kind of let the musicians know ahead of time. Uh, what the computer is going to generate, but everything that is generated is basically uh, using the statistics or the probabilities of, of the musician. So um, maybe a short example here. So what we see here, I mean, this is the future. This is what the computer is going to generate from the past. So the musician kind of can plan his own improvisation on the bottom to match between these two. So these would be the notes coming from from the system, from the from the computer, and the musician kind of can design what he's going to play, so it will react together in some kind of a you know, coherent way. Um, you know the, the reactions people have to working with such a system. Is, I think it's a lot of fun, kind of just looking and seeing what how it kind of boosts somebody's creativity. So here's a short example of. Uh, Bernard Lubin, who is a French improviser, who was one of the early musicians who used these systems. So he kind of starts entering his own materials. Oh, sorry. And then the computer starts improvising. And then he kind of has to think about what he does. So. Now his reactions are kind of pretty amazing. Isn't it? So 
ouais, être chouette, les mecs, 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 I introduce into the improvisation. A lot of this is really free improvisation, but uh, you can also use the same methods to design music, which is maybe much more conventional with with chords and melody and um, uh, classical or pop style. Uh, and we'll talk about this later on. So, uh, um, you know, other way to, to, to use this system is basically to trigger uh, a pre, um, pre-trained or pre-analyzed music uh, that will try to navigate whatever the computer generates uh, from another input. And in this case, uh, you know, I'm improvising on a pre-analyzed piece by Stravinsky. The amount of notes that I'm playing is much smaller possible use of this thing in, in live systems and, and one of the reasons I wanted to bring this uh, before we uh, will jump next week into deep uh, learning methods that emulate the style and uh, are able to generate something which kind of captures the statistical structure of, of music. Uh, a lot of the deep, deep learning methods do incredible job after they've been trained on a large corpus uh, a lot of the advantages of these real-time systems are that um, over the more, I would say, shallow systems is that they can operate in the real-time fashion. They can actually very efficiently build a dictionary of possible continuations and then uh, recombine them. Uh, another aspect that we'll talk about is how do you regenerate? Because as we said, to create these sequences, you actually have to use very efficient and only partial representation of your audio. You don't really, or audio or MIDI, because the complexity of the events that happen is quite prohibitive. You cannot actually capture everything as a, as a different symbol, as a different uh, alphabet um, expression. You have to work on a much smaller reduced representation in order to be able to create structures or find repetitions. And, and this will be a question that kind of relates to the idea of red distortion that we mentioned in the previous uh, um, set of slides is that you, uh, to be able to generalize, to be able to generate new materials, in some sense, you have to compress, you have to go through some kind of a bottleneck that will reveal structure. Uh, and then you can generate back from the structure some variations. Of course, they will not be exactly reconstruction of the material because you do want to have this ability to uh, create new, um, uh, new sequences or be, uh, creative in, 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 in the musical sense or in the artistic sense. So this is kind of the essence of, uh, uh, let me stop this. Okay, I think this is pretty much the essence of this slide. Uh, let me stop the recording and see if you have any questions about, um, about this.